Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny, Handmaid's Tale, Season 3, Episode 13, May Day. It's the last episode of the season. Some people are upset at its ending, but I'll tell you after this review why I think not only it's a great stopping point for Season 3, but a great starting point for Season 4 that's coming up next. episode begins we see June we can only see partial of her face she's looking through what looks to be plastic barriers between her and the next something in the next room she peeks through the liners and she sees that guards are pushing handicapped children and what appears to be children that have down syndrome you see people on walkers, a lot of people that are handicapped that are being pushed into this van. They're yelling vulgarities, beeps get into the van, shut up, we don't wanna hear it. You see them screaming, you see confusion. You don't know what's going on. You don't know if this is now, if it's in the past. You can only see so much. June is holding back tears and we don't know if she's hiding or what's going on. So you continue to follow the scene. June then later we can see she's surrounded by other women and we can conclude that she is having a flashback of when they were rounding up women to go to Gilead. They pull them out of this cage. They say move it, move it, move it. You can tell they're still in normal attire so they don't have any Gilead clothing. So that confirms that this is before Gilead. They are sifting women and they are seeing who is who and what is what. They put them in this cage and she is looking around and trying to figure out what's going on and as they are going down this hall to get into a van she sees flashes of different rooms some rooms show women who are completely naked surrounded by surrounded by doctors so it's evident that they're being observed and that they're looking at the, these women so it's a very very harsh and vulgar scene they pass by another window and they see more women going towards in the opposite direction so they have tons and tons of women going back and forth and up and down these hallways and they're being herded like cows into these cages. She sees a guard and she thinks that it's going to get some type of head nudge or maybe this is a good guy to see, hey, what the heck is going on? She taps him on the shoulder and she says, look, I'm just trying to look for my daughter. They took my daughter. Do you know where she is? And the judge tells her to be quiet. She asks it again, and he basically puts his finger up to his mouth like, it will be best that you're quiet. They load them onto the van. Women are screaming and holding hands, and they're trying to comfort each other because they have no idea where they are going. The writing in that scene allows the viewer to feel the fear of uncertainty of what's going on. Is it a war? Are we being kidnapped? Where are we going? What is happening? And in those moments, you see clips and shots of complete strangers holding hands and hugging each other, comforting each other in that time of need, which blends into the next scene where she is in Gilead in her handmaid's tail uniform walking to the market but in this case she is escorted by a soldier she's walking down the street and she has her bag and as handmaids are passing her they are putting soap in her bag discreetly of course sneaking the soap in the bag from that you can kind of conclude their gathering up supplies secretly for this run and getting 52 children out of Gilead, sneaking them out, out of there, getting on a plane, which they have been secretly communicating to get out. We see June, she's walking to the market or home, or wherever she's going, and she sees Aunt Lydia, and of course, Aunt Lydia, and I'm thinking, ooh, here we go. And Aunt Lydia says to June, basically a kind of nudge of, you know what's going on you know I saw somebody drop something in your bag or whatever the case may be she's kind of checking her out and she's like well what's up with that she's like oh just you know nothing and Aunt Lydia tells her a lot of these handmaids look up to you 
but but watch it. So it's kind of that instilling fear of don't forget where you are. You might have gotten away with certain things in the past, but Aunt Lydia was saying from her perspective, watch out, you're still in Gilead. And then you see June respond to her in such a way as if she has no fear. She's so ready to get out of Gilead and try to just fulfill this plan of helping people escape out of Gilead. June makes it back to Joseph's house and you see all of these supplies that are on the kitchen table, apples and soap and bread and things that you would think of somebody would tuck away as if they were running. And she's cutting the soap into many pieces for all of the people that are planning to escape. And we have the, the other Martha that comes into the kitchen to talk to June and she's just telling her, well, you know, I used to try to study for the MCAT before Gilead. And June's just ignoring her. You know, you could tell me something. Beth doesn't want me to do anything, but she's sick. And, and, and June's paying her no mind. Like, okay. And she says, look, I'm not a child. Basically pressing her to say, I'm not a child. Can you talk to me? Can you communicate? Can you help me do something? And June looks her in the eyes and says, then stop waiting on somebody to hold your hand and be an adult and help around here. And just try to see what's going on. Open your eyes and don't be so naive. So... Joseph, he comes into the door, he sees June, you know, planning all of the, getting everything together, planning and wrapping things up, and he asks the other Martha, hey, could you get this wrinkle out of my jacket? I gotta be somewhere, and she says, well, you know, I can't. I'm busy helping June prepare everything. So he's aware, and he knows, and he is the link that is needed to get them out of Gilead, because he got all the hookups, remember? So they're slowly getting stuff in and they're going over what they need to do and how they need to do it. Beth, she comes out of the area. Before she comes out of the area, Joseph says, so Beth is sick. And June says, yeah, she's, she's been sick. And he said, well, it's the fear that she might die. In other words, Beth is feeling the anxiety of if we get caught, we could die. So she had this anxiety and sickness that was crippling her. But then we see her walk into the room. She's collecting herself and getting herself back together. And she talks with June and she's just helping her put things into the basement, preparing for everybody to make this escape. When June, she's getting this Vaseline and she's blinding the windows and blurring the windows. So if somebody happens to look in, they can't really tell. They probably would only be able to see silhouettes. She goes outside with the bucket of Vaseline and she's greasing all of the gates to prevent any squeaking or any type of noise when they go into this plan as they escape. As she does that, she hears some just ruffling in the bushes and she sees a Martha and a child. And immediately June's just like, dang it, dang, because that was not the plan. The plan was to meet and have everybody that was supposed to escape at nightfall, closest to midnight, so everybody could be in the darkness and not easily seen. So she says, oh, just come on. So she leads her into the house and I'm already like, oh, People are already not following directions, and this plan is not going to go well. And as a viewer, I'm just, just got butterflies in my stomach, and I'm thinking this is not going to end well. She leads her into the house. They bring them in, and of course, Beth, she sees them walking in like, what the heck is going on? It's bright daylight outside. They're not supposed to be here tonight, fall. June says, I know that. Calm it down. Let's take them into the basement. They take them into the basement. June is catering to the little girl whose feet is blistered and worn because they've been in the woods for a while trying to get to Joseph's house so they can escape. And June is putting ointment on her feet and she's telling her, look, everything's going to be okay. If this hurts, let me know. I just want to tend to your foot. And the little girl expresses that she's young and she vaguely remembers what it used to be like before Gilead and June tells her we're going somewhere where you can think how you want to think you don't have to be a wife you can pursue your pursue your dreams you can do whatever you want 
and basically just be a kid. So the girl feels comforted and comforted and she says, well, I can do anything I want. This epiphany of, wow, that's a totally different world or a totally different thing from where I am now. And she says, yes, that's what you can have. And in the midst of that moment, the Martha that brought the child, she comes bursting in. She's just like, I'm done. I'm not going to do it. We're going back. She immediately starts panicking and says, come on, I'm taking the kid. I got to get out of here. And she, June says, but you can't leave. And I thought, oh. Here we go, another Tom Cruise, <laughs> War of the Worlds uh, moment in the movie to where in that movie, the, the threat was making noise and if the aliens heard you, they had you. And a little side note, and Tom Cruise and his daughter, they're in this house hiding and hiding and the guy that was in the house kept talking and Tom Cruise gave that look like, I'm gonna have to kill him. Cause we trying to get out of here, same thing. June looks at the Martha and she says, you can't leave. And I understood that because if you leave, highly likely you're snitching on this entire operation. And June proceeds to hold a gun to this lady's face like Tony Montana and says, you're not going anywhere. And the lady says, look, the lady will know. She will come looking for us because the daughter is gone and they'll kill both of us. So if we get back, she's really understanding. Maybe if I just tell her we were gone too long, we'll be okay. And June says, look, <laughs> I will pop you with this gun. I will shoot you in your face. You cannot leave. And so June grabs the little girl like to say, if you're going to leave, you can leave. But I'm keeping her. And that Martha takes off. She's out of there. She, she had to change her heart. She just left. So we cut back to Miss Serena. Because you know she's been in Canada just kicking it. You know? And she is out in the morning and she's sipping coffee or tea and you know the investigator from Canada he walks up to her and says oh hey you know how you doing and she says I'm good and he tells her well you know you have two more meetings to speak with the United States they would like to question you and also a few more representatives from Canada would like to talk with you as well and ask you some more questions about Gilead and Serena's just really treating it like she's at the office and says oh can I push back some of those meetings or can I politely decline and he just gives this smirk like no <laughs> and she is really leaning on this being excluded or charged with anything because she's given up Fred. Now, I've been saying, look, if Fred go, Serena got to go because she's just as guilty. But, of course, she has immunity for giving up Fred. And he says, look, we got a lot of meetings. It's okay, but I got a surprise for you. He goes into his pocket and he gives her like this fob or this access badge. And he says, this badge will allow you to go in and out of the facility. You no longer are in containment. You can go where you want to go. And Serena's just so pleased, like, wow, I can go anywhere I want to go without an escort. And he's looking at her like, yeah, this is, this is pretty much freedom. Yeah. So that's her moment. We then cut back to Joseph's house and he tells June, look, that little girl, she gotta go back to Lexington because that Martha just took off. When that Martha gets back to that house, they're gonna be looking for that child. They'll probably arrest and kill her, but they're gonna come looking for that child and they will go house to house. She has to go back. And June has this look of desperation and anger and sadness and she says look I cannot let this little girl go back to this world that you created he says look <laughs> you have to understand that they can close the border they can now set up traps in the road looking for a child i.e. They could shut down this entire operation and now we're more on alert and there are more eyes open and looking at us and everybody if we don't take this little girl back and she's got to go back with that Martha. Too many red flags are going to be going up if that little girl is still gone but the Martha's back home. It's going to look too suspicious and June says no I don't think you understand and she holds that gun like 
this is not your house. And I thought, oh, here we go, June. Because June been getting on my nerves this season, okay? Because June has made so many rational decisions to where I really started to despise the character. It wasn't until last episode where I was just like, okay, you get some cool points. But it made me think of this. As a viewer, you're looking at it and you're like, June, this is ridiculous. Why would you do that? You're risking so many lives and it's selfish. Yes, it's very selfish. So selfish that if it's a burning, if it's a room and it's fire everywhere and it's 10 people in the room saying, help me, help me, help me, and your mother's in there, who are you going to say first? Your mama. <laughs> yes, you care for those other people and you'll probably come back for them. But you're not thinking of anybody else. That desperation, that confusion, not thinking rationally is human. Not being so clear-minded that it makes the character perfect. So they wanted to make June imperfect. So I figured that out and I said that's probably what they're doing. They're making June imperfect because nobody's perfect and in desperate times and desperate needs, People can be selfish and people don't care about who else is hurt or who else goes on. Because if you know that you your mama is on the other side and you're going to save her, if Jimmy John fall and <laughs> a boulder fall on his head, you're going to be like, oh, rest in peace. But let me get my mama. So that is what was going on with June. June is at a desperate measure to where she's so desperate to get everybody out. She's saying these stupid things like this is not your house. This is not your mission. I, it's, I'm going to do this kind of attitude the not the cockiness but the desperation then we see fred he's in this room and he looks like he's just been questioned to death he looks like he's just been interrogated all day he has darkness under his eyes gray his chic haircut that he's always kept so dapper is starting to get a little raggedy starting to look more like a prisoner starting to look more like a criminal that you are and he's answering questions and he's saying all of this. And after that, Fred says, so basically, you know, when is this gonna end? And this is ridiculous. And the representative from Canada says, we're sorry, it's a lot of steps. We have to interrogate you, America's next. They wanna question you as well. And Fred, he turns around as if he has an epiphany and says, well, what about Serena? And I thought, what? I called it in the other review. I called it, y'all. He says, well, Serena is just as guilty. And I have information about her crimes, rape and murder. And the representative from Canada says, well, she's completely immune to certain things. And he goes, no, 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 no. I got some other information. And I said, I knew it because there's no way that anybody is gonna that they're gonna go to jail and not take anybody else with them and he says hey if i'm going to jail serena you was there with me and i said oh what is he gonna tell this representative from canada what is he gonna tell this investigator and i'm like oh she's next it's getting closer to the time where we have reached the crescendo of this entire season june and beth and other Martha, Marthas and children that are slowly coming to Joseph's house. They're hiding in the basement. And Beth and June, they say to each other, look, Joseph, he's saying he's going to kill this whole operation and we need to wait and it's too much security, but we need to go ahead with this because we might not have another chance to get the hell up out of here. So one of the Marthas suggests, well, we could follow the creek, so we'll have to walk. Instead of driving to get to the area where the plane is, we can walk, we can be in the forest, and we can go along the creek area. So they're desperate, so they pretty much say, hey, this is what we got to do. And they make those moves to start to get gather everybody and say, okay, here we go. They get in the supplies. And who shows up outside? It's Rita, another Martha, and a child. And Rita says to June, we made it as soon as we could. They're holding an infant child. And she says... She couldn't really escape, so she had to kill them. And I thought, whew. once again, showing the desperation point of getting out. The point of not fearing death anymore, or at least 
trying to get out, if death comes, at least you tried. So I understand the direction of what they're doing and why they're doing it because you have to think what would you have done in that situation. I really started to get nervous because we saw little kids gathering eight years old, nine years old, maybe a five year, year old. But when I saw the infant, I said, oh, because an infant, okay, unpredictable. You don't know when they're going to whimper or cry. And I thought, oh, it's probably going to be the baby that creates some noise and gets them all caught. We cut back to Miss Serena. She's in Canada, she's holding Nicole, and she's talking with her, and she's listening to the baby coo and giggle and whimper, and she's holding her. And the investigator from Canada, he strolls up to her, and I said, oh, here we go, here we go. And he says, Serena, could you put the baby down, please? I said, who? Get her, get her. And she says, well, why? And she, he says, you are under arrest for murder and rape. I said, I knew it. Fred ain't going down. He's, he was saying, look, I'm going to tell them what, <laughs> what they need to know. You really thought that you was going to snitch on me and that it was only going to be me when you helped create this world of Gilead? We cut to June, the Marthas and the children. They're going through the woods. They're trying to make sure everybody is in close proximity so they're not walking out of line and crunching too many leaves or making too much noise, reminding the children to please be quiet. And, shh, shh, shh. and they're telling them it's okay. And they're getting them and rounding them up because kids are kids. And we see flashes of security and guards. They're on their rounds, building up the fear of them escaping. So as they're escaping, the security, you can tell, is increasing because there's more and more trucks that are going up and down the street. Now we know that what Joseph was saying, they have increased the security. They are looking for children that are gone. People are starting to notice the children are not at home. They go through the forest, they go through the forest, and they get to the stopping point, the next resting slash stopping point to regather themselves to keep going and to proceed to the plane. They get to the house and they notice that the light is off, which is a bad sign. The signal was supposed to be a distinctive red light in the window letting them know it's okay to come in and they didn't see a light and I'm thinking maybe they got whoever was at that stopping point and it's a wrap they sneak into the house there's no lights it's, it's dark it's like an empty creepy house and as they enter the house we see this big room of at least 100 Marthas and children that are in there and who's in the middle of the crowd is Joseph reading them a nice story because keep in mind they have not been able to read better yet be around a book of reading anything and they're so into tune of what he's saying and you can tell that he's doing something to soothe them and calm them and June is looking at all of the people and she has this in her gut and she knows that he wanted to help and he wanted to contribute and he wanted to put some type of band-aid on this monster that he created. And that's what he was doing. You could tell he was trying to make the best of his evil that he had done in this world that he created. And it was way more than their goal of 52 people. Now it was probably 152 people. And she thought that they, that, that Joseph completely cut off and shut down their journey but seeing him there she knew instantly that joseph was going to help out and make sure that certain barriers or certain ways to walk were guarded and that they could possibly get out one of the handmaids tells june look we might want to hurry this up because when i before i left the house it was already an alert to the guards that they're going to go from house to house looking for these children they're not going to skip over any houses. Every house that they got on the map, they're going to go from door to door. So June says, you know what? 
we can't rest that long. We got to get out. We got to go. So they gather everybody again. Now you have hundreds of people going through this forest. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. And they're going through this forest and they're walking. And we're, we're seeing miniature time lapses of them walking and walking and walking. And in the midst of their weakness and being fatigued, they see the plane. The plane is waiting. Okay? The only issue is between the plane and the forest is a guard in a truck with rounds and a big old light spanning back and forth in the forest trying to see something that can give them any type of inclination of somebody getting on this plane who's not supposed to get on this plane. So June starts to tell Rita and a lot of the Marthas, oh, you know, be safe and here you go. And I'm thinking, June, you better not be doing what I think you're doing. <laughs> you better not. And she's telling her, hey, you guys get the children. You go this way. And Rita says, thank you for doing this. And I'm thinking, June, June, <laughs> June. June is about to sacrifice herself and some other Marthas excuse me, some other handmaids decide to join her. And I thought, what are they about to do? And they go into the forest and you see the groups, they split up into two. A lot of them go to the left and June and some other handmaids go the other way. They dip down, they look through the gate, they see the guy, I think he's smoking a cigarette or something. And they proceed to throw rocks, stones rather, at the guy that busting windows in the truck and he's like, man, I don't know what's going on because it's dark and it's in the forest and he can't see. He can only see what the light sees that's on the top of the truck. And he's trying to see what's going on and he's getting bombarded. And as they're throwing the stones and distracting the guard, the Marthas and the children are running, walking quickly to the plane. So June and some other handmaids have sacrificed themselves so the children and the Marthas can get on the plane to escape. They're throwing as many stones as they can as more and more get on the plane. The guard at this point says, okay, he gets a break from the stones. He gets out the machine gun. And as he's getting out the machine gun, he's shooting blindly into the forest. He can't see any targets, but he's just shooting. And as he's shooting, he's unfortunately shooting some handmaids here and there. So we don't know who's dead because it's dark. We don't know who's getting hit. And as they're shooting and they're on the ground kind of trying to cover themselves from any flying bullets, they're looking at each other like, if we die, you know, we tried. We were a shield to the children and everybody trying to get away. And they give each other that comfort and look like, if we die, you know, at least we did our best, you know. So as they're down there, you see June get up and walk towards the light. And I'm thinking, no. And I'm thinking, well, clearly, you know, she can't die, ain't, ain't she the main character? <laughs> but she's walking towards the light, literally sacrificing herself to say to him, hey, I'm here to be another distraction so more and more people can get on the plane. She is exposing herself so the guard will have a clear target and come after her. So he sees her and he's running after June and June is running to, into the forest and she's alone. You don't see anybody with her. And as she's running, you hear the bullets just flying past her head and over her head and one finally gets her and you hear the shot and you hear that she's hitting and she slowly hits the ground. And I'm thinking, oh, June, June. And she falls, and the guy runs up to her. And as he's running up to her and turns her around, she has a gun. And she points it at his head, and he has a walkie-talkie system. And you hear the people, hey, you okay? We heard gunshots. What's going on? And she said, tell them everything's clear. Like, don't get your head blown off. Tell them everything's clear. And he thinks about it. And he gets on the walkie-talkie, and he says, Everything's clear. And June says, good, good. And I'm thinking to myself, June, you got to do this. You got to kill him, man. Because if you don't, 
He knows you. He knows what's going on, that, that you're trying to get somewhere or do something. And she gives that look to herself and closes her eyes like, I got to do this. And she shoots him in the his head. And as she shoots him in the head, she's fatigued and she's still hurt from being shot. And she kind of falls to her knees and I'm thinking, oh, June, hold on, get onto that plane. And she's laying on her back. And as she's laying on her back, looking at the night sky, she sees the plane take off. I said, oh, no. <laughs> they gone. And June has a look of sadness, but also joy in knowing that they got away. But again, for like the third or fourth time, June is still in Gilead and didn't get to escape. We then see later the plane pulling into a port. It's landed. We see the Canadian flag. They've made it. And there's a volunteer area where people who want to help because they know who's on this plane. They know that it's people who have escaped from Gilead. We see Mario, we see Luke, we see other people that were stuck in Gilead. They're, they're helping and they're putting out tables and band-aids and bandages and they're yelling out, hey, it's no telling what we're about to see on this plane. Be prepared. They don't know if people shot up. They don't know if people stabbed up. They don't know what's on this plane. So when it lands, Mario, she gets on the plane and when she gets on this plane, she is shocked to see all these children and she says, oh, she can't believe what she sees. And the same little girl that June was talking, of, talking to earlier in the episode, she says, excuse me, miss, is this the place where I get to do what I want? And her, her, her eyes tear up and she says, yes, let's get you off of this plane. The crescendo of the episode. They're getting everybody off the airplane and Moria says, hey, to the little girl, well, what's your name? And the little girl looks to the side, and we hear a man say, Rebecca? And the little girl starts to lean and go towards him. And Moria says, whoa, do you know this man? And you can see in her eyes that that's her father. And the little girl is in disbelief, and the father is just in shock that he's seeing his daughter again. She looks like she's about seven years old. And she starts to run to her father and she says, Daddy? And she, clearly she know who that is, okay? Because she took off and gave the biggest hug that you can think of. Oh, as a viewer to think this father that has no idea where his child is because his child was taken pre-Gilead. What a touching scene, and I got so teary-eyed when I saw that. So they had their moment, and the daughter reunites, reunites with his, his, I'm sorry, a daughter reunites with her father. As people are getting off the plane, though, Luke, June's husband, is looking at everybody get off the plane, and he's saying, Hannah, come on, Hannah, and he wants his daughter to get off that plane. But unfortunately, everybody has unloaded, and Hannah's not on that plane, and June's not on that plane. And you see the look of disappointment. And Rita, she sees Luke. She, knew, she knows who Luke is. June's told her over and over again who Luke is. And she says, Luke, and he's confused. He doesn't know who she is. And she says, I know so much about you. And he's just confused, like, how does this lady know me? And she tells Luke, your wife, your wife did this. June did this. And he has that look like, that's great. I'm glad y'all are here. But of course, he's yearning and longing for his wife and his child. The final scene. It's morning. The sun's out. We see the forest. It zooms to June. She's laying there. She still has the dead guard that's a couple of feet over from her. And you hear footsteps and you think, oh to capture June. She got to go back to Gilead. And it's other handmaids that were with her throwing the stones. And they get her 
and they pick her up and they carry her off and take her somewhere. We don't know, but it's evident, right, that they're taking her somewhere where clearly they've hidden all night long. It's clearly somewhere safe enough or, or concealed enough to where guards and everything else that might have looked for them all night didn't see them. And then the episode concludes. That was the end. Season 3, episode 13, Mayday. Now on to my predictions of season 4 and what I thought of this last episode. A lot of people were upset about the ending of this episode, but I'll tell you why I'm not upset and that how I can see, even though she didn't get out, why I think this is a wonderful blend into season four and what to expect. Are you upset that she didn't get out? Are you upset that other main handmaids that we know didn't get out either? How do you feel about that? But this is my prediction of why it was a good ending. So think about what has happened and who has been captured. We have Fred and we have Serena. The entire time Fred was in confinement and answer, answering questions, he gave very broad answers, probably didn't give up any names, said, well, I, or, you know, Fred, were you the leader of this? Did you command this? I helped to put together some meetings, knowing he was a commander. But what did he do under pressure and realizing that Dude, you might get <laughs> locked up for the rest of your life. He gives up Serena. Now Serena is in confinement as being charged as a murderer and a rapist and, and, and a war criminal. She's going to sing too. There's no way that they are going to take the bind for all of Gilead. They are ready to sing like Boys, okay? Birds. They are ready to give up some names. The main problem and the main issue why America and uh, Canada couldn't really penetrate a lot of areas with Gilead is because they couldn't penetrate who was who and what was what and secret roads and certain trade areas. Everything was so secretive. Gilead did a wonderful job okay of keeping things so secretive not letting it be known who the commanders were who the leaders were now that canada and the united states have some names they have some possible connection points of who's in control we also have commander wilson he's gone are the people that are under all of these commanders are, are they going to start snitching they probably will because who wants to take a fault for a crime that all of us have contributed in, right? They are gonna sing like birds and it's just gonna have a domino effect and commander after commander after commander. And slowly, I think they will start to penetrate Gilead better now that they have an understanding of who is who. Because Serena's thinking about that baby that's not her. <laughs> Fred is revengeful, revengeful, right? And spiteful that Serena even did what she did. They will start snitching and talking about what's what and who's who. The more information they give, maybe their punishment won't be as bad. So they think. Also, I do predict, unfortunately, that Joseph will be killed and murdered because he just had all these Marthas and all these kids get out of Gilead via his connection with the, with the possible plane or knowing of the plane or acting dumb of what was going on. They trust his judgment, but they're going to put two and two together that it's possible that he could have helped June and everybody else escape. So I think that uh, Joseph will see his fate, and I think he's already accepted his fate in knowing that after all of this, he will be on the wall, or he will be killed, or he will be murdered. Because, <laughs> or, or they may keep him because there's only so many commanders left, and will other commanders see this as an opportunity to escape them damn selves? Like, <laughs> maybe they really didn't want that job in the first place. Maybe they really want to get out themselves. Serena did, and she was sold Team Gilead in the beginning. You also have to understand, this is a television show, right? But since it is a very dramatic television show, I hope they don't go the Walking Dead route and get greedy. 
and keep it churning and going and dragging it on and like what's the conclusion of this and when is it gonna stop i honestly hope that they only go no further than a season five or maybe even end it in season four it shouldn't go any further than that what we have to learn and understand is that a show can't be some disney oh we made it to canada the end no there's so many pieces to war, getting out of the war. What's next? Is it Canada? Is it the United States? Is Gilead gone completely? That is a lot to break down and explain. It can't simply be, we made it out of Gilead, we're in Canada now, the end. No, there's always this constant threat to what is going on, right? We have to keep that in mind. So I do hope that they take season four to be more on the end of not focusing on Gilead, but focusing on maybe the viewpoint of the United States and Canada of how they're going to penetrate these areas of Gilead and take it down. That would be what the audience will need. We already know about Gilead. We already seen what never do that. It's time to flip it around and see what they've been doing from the other side. That would be genius if they did that for season four and season five not necessarily putting everything in a nice bag and in a bowl and perfect ending perfectly but season four or five should end in such such a way that the audience knows that there's this hope lingering that gilead will fall let me know what you think you guys i hope you love this review since that show is coming it's already over i will make the announcement on the new shows that i will be reviewing pose is coming to an end Queen Sugar's coming to an end, and now Handmaid has ended. As I said before in my introduction video, when one show ends, another one will take its place. Let me know what you think of thought about this last episode. Subscribe, you guys. Share your opinion. Share the video on social media. Uh, click the notification bell so you don't miss any posts. It's not over. It's more shows coming. And follow me on Instagram, same profile name, official bun underscore E. Love y'all. Bye.